Thank you for being here. <clears throat> and um, I say thank you for being here because um, I was silent for 17 years. And the first words that I spoke were in Washington, D.C. on the 20th anniversary of Earth Day, and my family and friends had gathered there to hear me speak. And I said, thank you for being here. My mother, out in the audience, he jumped up, hallelujah, Johnny's talking. <laughs> Imagine if you were quiet for 17 years and your, your mother was out in the audience, if you would say. Um, <clears throat> my dad said to me, that's one. I'll explain that. But I turned around because I, I didn't recognize where my voice was coming from. I hadn't heard my voice in 17 years, so I turned around and I looked and I said, God, who's saying what I'm thinking? <laughs> and, and then I realized it was me, you know, and, and, and I kind of laughed. And I could see my father say, yeah, he really is crazy. <laughs> well, I want to um, take you on this journey. And the journey, I, I believe, is a metaphor for all of our journeys. And, and so um, even though this one is a kind of unusual, I want you to think about your own journey. Uh, my journey began uh, in 1971 when I witnessed uh, two oil tankers collide beneath the Golden Gate, and a half a million gallons of oil spilled into the bay. It disturbed me so much that I decided that I was going to give up riding and driving in motorized vehicles. That's a big thing in California. And it was a big thing in my little community of Point Reyes station in Inverness, California, because there was only about maybe 350 people there in the winter. This was back in 71 now. And so when I came in and I, I started walking around, um, people, it, they just knew what was going on. And people would drive up next to me and say, John, what are you doing? And I'd say, well, I'm, uh, I'm walking for the environment. And they said, no, you're walking to make us look bad, right? You're, you're walking to make us feel bad. And, and maybe there was some truth to that because I thought that if I started walking, everyone would, you know, follow. Because of the oil, everybody talked about the pollution. And so I argued with people about that. I argued and I argued. I called my parents up. I said, I've given up riding and driving in cars. My dad said, why didn't you do that when you were 16? <laughs> I didn't know about the environment then. They're back in Philadelphia. And so um, I told my mother I'm happy, though. I'm really happy, she said. And if you were happy, son, you wouldn't have to say it. Mothers are like that. <laughs> <laughs> and so on my, my 27th birthday, I decided, because I argued so much and I talked so much, you see, <laughs> that I was going to stop speaking for just one day. One day to give it a rest. And so I did. I got up in the morning and I didn't say a word. And I have to tell you, it was a very moving experience because for the first time, I began listening in a long time. And, and what I heard, it kind of disturbed me because what I used to do when I thought I was listening was I would listen just enough to hear what people had to say and think that I could I knew what they were going to say, and so I stopped listening, and in my mind, I just kind of raced ahead and thought of what I was going to say back while they were still finishing up. And then I would launch in. Well, that just ended communication. So on this first day, I actually listened, and it was very sad for me because I realized that for those many years, I had not been learning. I was 27. I thought I knew everything. I didn't. And so I decided I'd better do this for another day. And another day, and another day, until finally I, I promised myself for a year I would keep quiet because I started learning more and more, and I needed to learn more. So for a year I said I would keep quiet, and then on my birthday I would reassess what I had learned, and maybe I would talk again. Well, that lasted 17 years. Now, during that time, that 17 years, um, I walked and I, I 
played the banjo and I painted and I wrote my journal and I tried to study environment by reading books and I decided I was going to go to school. So I did. I walked up to Ashland, Oregon, where they were offering a, an environmental studies degree. <laughs> It's only 500 miles. <laughs> and uh, I went into the uh, registrar's office and. What? 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 <laughs> I had a newspaper clipping. Oh, so you really want to go to school here? You don't. I, we have a special program for you. They did. And in those two years, I graduated with my first degree, a bachelor's degree, and my father came out. He was so proud. He said, listen, we're really proud of you, son. But what are you going to do with a bachelor's degree? You don't ride in cars. You don't talk. You're going to have to do those things. <laughs> I hunched my shoulder. I picked my backpack up again, and I started walking. I walked all the way up to Port Townsend, Washington, where I built a wooden boat, rode it across Puget Sound, Idaho, walked across Washington, Idaho, and down to Missoula, Montana. I had written the University of Montana two years earlier and said I'd like to go to school there. I said I'd be there in about two years. <laughs> <laughs> and I was there. I showed up at two years, and um, they, I, I tell this story because they really helped me. Um, there are two stories in, this mon in Montana. The first story is I didn't have any money. That's a sign I used a lot. Um, and they said, oh, don't worry about that. The director of the program said, come back tomorrow. Gave me $150. And he said, register for one, one credit. Uh, you're going to go to South America, aren't you? And I said, rivers and lakes, the hydrological system, South America. So I did that. He came back, he said to me, he said, okay, John, now that you've registered for that one credit, you can have a key to an office, you can matriculate, you're matriculating, so you can use the library, and what we're going to do is we're going to have all of the professors allow you to go to class, they're going to save your grade, and when we figure out how to get you the rest of the money, then you can register for that class and they'll give you the grade. Wow, they don't do that in graduate schools, I don't think. But I use that story because they really wanted to help me. They saw that I was really interested in environment, and they really wanted to help me along the way. And during that time, I actually taught classes without speaking. And I had 13 students when I first walked into the class, and um, I explained with a friend who could uh, interpret my sign language that I was John Francis, I was walking around the world, I didn't talk, and this is the last time this person's going to be here interpreting for me. All the students sat around and they went... <laughs> I could see they were looking for the schedule to see when they could get out. <laughs> they had to take that class with me. Two weeks later, everyone was trying to get into our class. And I learned in that class, because I would do things like this, And they're all gathering around, go, what's he trying to say? I, I don't know. I think he's talking about clear-cutting. Yeah, clear-cutting. No, 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 that's not clear-cutting. That's, uh, he's, he's using a hand saw. Well, you can't, you, you can't clear-cut with a hand. Yes, you can clear-cut. No, I think he's talking about selective forestry. Now, this was a discussion class, and we were having a discussion. <laughs> <laughs> I just backed out of that, you know, and I just kind of kept the fist from flying. Um, but what I learned was that sometimes I would make a sign and they said things that I absolutely did not mean. But, but I should have. <laughs> and so what, what came to me was if you were a teacher and you were teaching, if, if you weren't learning, you probably weren't teaching very well. And so I went on, my dad came out to see me graduate and you know, I did the deal and my father said, we're really proud of you son, but you know what he went on. He said, you gotta start riding and driving and be start talking. What are you going to do with a master's degree? I hunched my shoulder. I got my backpack and I went on to the University of Wisconsin. I spent two years there writing on oil spills. No one was interested in oil spills, but something happened. Exxon Valdez. And I was the only one in the United States writing on oil spills. My dad came out again. He said, 
I don't know how you do this, son. I mean, you, you don't ride in cars, you don't talk. My sister said, maybe I should leave you alone because you seem to be doing a lot better when you're not saying anything. <laughs> well, I put on my backpack again. I put my banjo and I walked all the way to the East Coast, put my foot in the Atlantic Ocean. It was seven years and one day it took me to walk across the United States. And on Earth Day, 1990, my 20th anniversary of Earth Day, that's when I began to speak. And that's what I said, thank you for being here, because it's sort of like that tree in the forest falling, and, and if there's no one there to hear, does it really make a sound? And I'm thanking you, and I'm thanking my family, because they had come to hear me speak. And that's communication. And they also taught me about listening, that they listened to me. And it's one of those things that came out of the silence, the listening to each other. Really very important. We need to listen to each other. Well, my journey kept going on. My dad said, that's one. And I still didn't let that go. Uh, I worked for the Coast Guard, was made a UN Goodwill Ambassador. I wrote regulations for the United States. I mean, I wrote oil spill regulations. I mean, it, 20 years ago, someone had, had said to me, John Nielsen, you really want to make a difference? <laughs> yeah, I want to make a difference. He said, you just start walking east. Get out of your car and just start walking east. And as I walked off a little bit, and they said, yeah, and shut up too. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to make a difference, buddy. <laughs> How could that be? How could that be? How could doing such a simple thing like walking and not talking make a difference? Well, my time at the Coast Guard was a really good time. And um, after that, I, I only worked one year. I said, that's enough. One year is enough for me to do that. I got on a sailboat and I sailed down through the Caribbean and, and walked through all the islands and to Venezuela. And, uh, you know, I forgot the, the most important thing, which is why I started talking, <laughs> which I have to tell you. I started talking because I had studied environment. I had studied environment at this, this level, this formal level, but there was this informal level. And the informal level, the, I learned about people and what we do and how we are. And environment changed from just being about trees and birds and endangered species to being about how we treated each other. Because if we are the environment, then all we need to do is look around us and see how we treat ourselves and how we treat each other. And so that's the message that I had, and I said, well, I'm going to have to spread that message. And so I got in my sailboat, sailed all the way through the Caribbean. It wasn't really my sailboat. I kind of worked on that boat. <laughs> got to Venezuela, and I started walking. This is the last part of this story because it's how I got here, because I still didn't ride in motorized vehicles. Um, I was walking through El Dorado. It's a, a prison town, famous prison or infamous prison in Venezuela. And I don't know what possessed me, because this was not like me. There I am walking past the guard gate, and the guard stops and says, Pasaporte, pasaporte and with an M16 pointed at me. And I looked at him and I said, passport? Huh. I don't need to show you my passport. It's in the back of my pack. I'm Dr. Francis. I'm a UN ambassador and I'm walking around the world. And I started walking off. What possessed me to say this thing? <laughs> the road turned into the jungle. I didn't get shot. And I got to, I start saying, free at last. Thank God Almighty, I'm free at last. What was that about, I'm saying? What was that about? It took me a hundred miles to figure out that in my heart, in me, I had become a prisoner. I was in prisoner, a prisoner and I needed to escape. The prison that I was in was the fact that I did not drive or use motorized vehicles. Now, how could that be? Because when I started, it seemed very appropriate to me. 
not to use motorized vehicles. But the thing that was different was every birthday I asked myself about silence, but I never asked myself about my decision to just use my feet. I had no idea I was going to become a UN ambassador. I had no idea I would have a PhD. And so I realized that I had a responsibility to more than just me. And that I was going to have to change. You know, we can do it. I was going to have to change. And I was afraid to change because I was so used to the guy who only just walked. I was so used to that person that I didn't want to stop. I didn't know who I would be if I changed. But I know I needed to. I know I needed to change because it would be the only way that I could be here today. And I know that a lot of times we find ourselves in this wonderful place where we've gotten to. But there's another place for us to go. And we kind of have to leave behind the security of who we've become and go to the place for who we are becoming. And so I want to encourage you to go to that next place, to let yourself out of any prison that you might find yourself in, as comfortable as it may be, because we have to do something now. We have to change now. As our former vice president said, we have to become activists. So if my voice can touch you, if my actions can touch you, if my being here can touch you, please let it be. And I know that all of you have touched me while I've been here. So let's go out into the world and take this caring, this love, this respect that we've shown each other right here at TED and take this out into the world because we are the environment and how we treat each other is really how we're going to treat the environment. So I want to thank you for being here and I want to end this in five seconds of silence. Thank you. Thank you.